Welcome and thank you for joining me. I'm really excited that you are considering a career in the early years. This webcast will hopefully talk you through the process of becoming a childminder and give you the information you need to make that really informed decision about your next steps. My name is Zoe and I, alongside my colleagues Sam and Sharon, form part of the Early Years team and we will be able to support you on your new adventure and very excited to be part of this. Please take a note of our email and contact us for anything Early Years, no question is too silly. Also check out the new Worcester Children's First website for information about Early Years. Now I am really conscious links throughout this presentation may not work as this is a recorded webcast. However, if you Google what's stated on the links, you should be able to access the content. So why Early Years? Now myself, Sam and Sharon are really, really passionate about the Early Years. And um, this is because it's such an important time in a child's life. And I wanted to share with you firstly, an image on brain development. So at birth, if we think the average baby's brain is about a quarter of the size of the average adult brain. And incredibly, this doubles in size in their first year. And this keeps growing to about 80% of adult size by their three years old and 90% nearly full grown by the age of five. So a newborn baby has all the brain cells known as neurons that they'll have for the rest of their life. But it's the connections between these cells that really make that brain work. So brain connections form through interaction and experience. And it's this that enables us to move, to think, to communicate and to do just about anything. The earliest childhood years are therefore crucial for making these connections as at least one million new neural connections known as synapses are made every second more than at any other time within a person's life. So different areas of the brain are responsible for different abilities, such as movement, language, emotion, and these develop at different rates. And brain development really builds upon itself as connections eventually link with each other in more complex ways. And it's this that enables the child to move and to speak and to think in more complex ways. So the early years are therefore the best opportunity for a child's brain to develop the connections they need and the amount and quality of care, stimulation and interaction that a baby or child receives in their early years makes all the difference. And these connections really do start from birth through everyday experiences and those positive relationships. And if you think of about a newborn baby, even at this very young age, they're serving up invitations to engage with their parents and other adult caregivers. So they might do that by cooing, smiling, crying. Toddlers, of course, communicate a little bit more directly. Um, but all, each of these little invitations is an opportunity for the caregiver to be responsive to the child's needs. And it's this serve and return process, which is really fundamental in wiring the brain. So those parents and caregivers who give attention, respond and interact with their child are literally building the child's brain. And that's why it's so important that we talk, we sing, we read and play with young children from the day they're born. And this gives them the opportunities to explore their physical world and to provide that safe, stable and nurturing environment. So a child's relationships with the adults in their lives really does have the most important influence on their brain development. And these loving relationships with responsive, dependable adults are essential to a child's healthy development. And these relationships generally will begin at home with parents and family, but they also do include childcare providers and wider family and friends. So as children who experience more positive interactions in their early years really go on to be healthier and more successful in life. But unfortunately, the opposite is true as well. And trauma or lack of access to quality early learning experiences can really negatively impact a child's early brain development and ultimately their long term success. So on this slide, you will see an image of synapse pruning. And this is a natural process where synapses are discarded as they are no longer needed and thinking develops. However, this demonstrates the small window in which to make these initial connections affecting the child and their transition into adulthood. So child minding can offer that really important role as a secondary caregiver in a unique home from home experience. And through those positive relationships, you can really inspire the next generation and help build those brains. But also you can help children feel safe and secure as it is only then that children can actually learn. Safeguard and protect children from harm, support your families and truly make a difference to children and families and future generations. 
Now I wanted to share with you a personal story. Do you remember a really great teacher? I'm going to tell you about Mrs. Mason. I was in year two and it was the nativity and I was chosen to play the coconuts as the donkey's hooves. She made me feel like I had the most important job in the whole production. And it just goes to show that that memory, I'm 50 now, so that has stuck, stuck with me for 45 years, how she made me feel. So it's our interactions with children which can stay with them for their whole life. So I suppose, in summary, what I'm trying to articulate to you is you are more than a minder of children. The term childminder really does not give this important role justice, as we will explore later in the webcast. If you do choose to follow this incredible career choice, you will be an early years professional, nurturing, caring and educating our future generations at the most influential time in their lives. So I'm hoping you're feeling inspired. Childminding really is a wonderful career choice and it allows us to spend time with children, so you've really got to love children to be able to do this job. It allows us to teach and embed children's learning through play and experiences and be a real part of that developmental journey for them. It gives you the flexibility of working from your own home and that may also allow you to work while caring for your own children. Um, I must, however, point out you can't register as a child minder if you are related to all of the children that you look after. And it gets you the opportunity to run your own business and have some autonomy over what you are doing. So childminding usually takes place in your own home alone. However, it doesn't need to be a solitary role if you didn't want it to be. There is an opportunity to co-mind with up to two other registered childminders at any one time. Now, each childminder must go through their own registration separately. Um, but you only need to apply as a childminder once, even if you work from a number of different homes. So say you co-mind with a friend and you work from each other's homes. You just need to tell offset about the homes where you will be working. So you can operate either as an individual. So I might choose to be um, a childminder on my own. So I would register as Zoe Caulfield. Or if I was co-minding, we might want to give our business an overarching name. So I might be trading Zoe Caulfield, trading as Shining Stars. But in terms of Ofsted registration purposes, I will be treated as an individual registered person. Um, you can choose to join a company after you register and you would not have to apply again. Alternatively, if you don't wish to work alone, um, and you don't want to co-mind, you can actually employ assistants who will need to get an enhanced check with Bardless from DBS. And you'd also need to use the child mind to report new adults in the home service. Assistants within your home cannot work unsupervised until they have received their suitability letter from Ofsted. And you can only leave assistants alone with children for up to two hours a day, and that's with parental permission. If you want to leave children alone with assistants for longer periods of time, the assistants must register as child minders in their own right and you would be their employer, so would have to comply with employer law legislation. And finally, if you work with three or more other child minders or assistants, this moves from child minding to childcare on domestic premises and you must register with Ofsted or with a child minder agency as child care. And if you're looking after children in the children's own home, apart from your own children, then you are actually classed as a nanny and you would need to follow guidance for this separately. So I'm hoping you are still intrigued and want to find out a little bit more. There is no doubt that child minder can be such a rewarding role. It offers a home from home environment, which many larger nurseries and preschool settings can sometimes struggle to recreate. Caring for those smaller numbers really gives that quality of care for children and allows them to feel safe, secure and ready to learn. It's an invaluable service to many of our families, which offers a much gentler transition into early education. However, you do need to think carefully about this decision. This will impact your family and the household, household in general. You may have to adapt the environment to accommodate your new business. And there are initial setup costs to consider before you even become registered and running your own business. And although very liberating, this also means you will have legal responsibilities. 
So I have thought carefully about the journey you are about to embark on and created six steps to becoming a childminder. So let's explore this a little bit further. So step one is the most important part of this journey is you and your family will really need to invest time and money into this process prior to becoming a childminder and certainly before making any money. We need to really consider how this will impact the family unit, the premises, which is our home at the end of the day, our financial situation and our responsibilities going forward. Really take time to talk to family members about how this may impact everyone. Ask those tricky questions and listen to what your family have to say. It can work and it does work successfully for many childminders who are very happy and see working from home as a great advantage. Just try to iron out any concerns at stage one of the process. So your most important consideration has to be your family as they need to be 100% on board as you will be inviting other families into their family home and safe space for long periods of time. So let's think about your own children. So if you have younger children, childminding can actually be a great solution to earning some money whilst caring for your own child. However, as they get older, life can become a little bit more complex. In terms of your own children, think about how you can give them that safe space to relax to. They are sharing not only their home, but you also, so may need some time to adjust. Think about how you're going to reduce anxiety of new people coming into the home and potentially playing and using their things. Have clear boundaries over what is used and involve your children in setting out those environments. And don't miss out on your own children's events or clubs. It's really important that this arrangement works for you and your family's lifestyle. Now, you also need to be realistic, as in early years, we can often find ourselves working after hours, prepping for the next day, cleaning, training or catching up with parents. It is important you think carefully about how you can achieve that work life balance you and your family deserve. In terms of partners, the same can apply to partners. So clear boundaries and expectations at the very start is a really good idea. Although they're not working directly with you and the children, they will inevitably come into contact with children and families and so really are an important part of your provision. And animals, of course, animals are part of your family and there are so many benefits for children to have access to animals. However, we must remember animals as part of our family too this will be a big change for them. So you need to make sure you are meeting all the needs. Risk assessments are a really good tool to support with this um, and identify how you can make this a positive experience for all. I have included a link on the slide to the Dogs Trust, which really advises on how we can support the relationship between, between children and animals. Despite all these considerations, this experience can be truly positive for the whole family and again enhances the home from home experience childminding promotes. It just requires a bit of forethought as to the logistics of working from home and how to retain that work life balance we all strive for. So the Early Years Foundation stage 2021 sets out what we must legally do as childminders and childcare providers and we will be dipping in and out of this documentation throughout this webcast. But let's see what it says about premises. Um, providers must ensure that their premises, including overall floor space and outdoor spaces, are fit for purpose and suitable for the age of children cared for and the activities provided on the premises. Providers must comply with requirements of health and safety legislation, including fire safety and hygiene requirements. Now, I'm going to re um, refer to the Early Years Foundation stage now as the EYFS. This is a term we generally use running out of words you see so planning how you use the space within your household is really really important and things to consider are where are the children going to sleep will they have access to outside is the indoor and outdoor space currently safe and secure what work may i have to do to ensure that it is safe do i need stair gates things like hot tubs can cause problems are they covered securely what about ponds do i need stickers on my glass patio doors how do I ensure children can't access chemicals, etc.? There's so much to think about. So risk assessments can be really useful here. I've also put on the bottom of the slide um, contact for Hereford and Worcester Fire Service, and they can help you with hints and tips of how to meet requirements. And importantly, family also come into this as they need to understand 
what a safe environment looks like and adhere to your expectations around this. So setup costs are a really important consideration before you even apply to be a childminder. And this really is dependent on your current qualifications, the suitability of your property at this time and any resources that you may already own. So it really is unique to you. However, the slide is here to sort of show you the basic costs that you may incur in setting up a childminder business. Now, remember, this is a business, so you will be able to put through these receipts as a business expense. So organisation is key. So DBS is for anyone 16 and over living or working in the home. There is also a £13 optional annual charge for the DBS update service, which allows that check to be reviewed annually, um, which is a recommendation. Health declarations. Now, these vary as you can see, between £20 and £130. And it's not even a medical, it's just, we'll go into it in more detail, but it's just like a doctor's note to say whether you're suitable. So this really depends on your GP. And so you would have to speak to them about the costs incurred for that. Now, as a childminder, you will automatically be the, become the designated safeguarding lead for your setting, which involves training biannually. Um, and as you can see, that's around £50 at the moment. But um, Worcestershire Children's First do also offer free access to safeguarding DSL network meetings where we keep you informed of what's going on within the local area. Pediatric first aid, so this is renewable every three years, it costs around £100. Now, if you do have childminder assistance and you have chosen to allow them um, to have access to the children on their own for two hours or less, then they would also need to have that qualification because they are alone with those children. EYF, EYFS training is completely variable and we recommend the Department for Education free training at the moment, which gives you a really good insight into the EYFS and how children learn. Now, some people like to uh, join subscription and membership services which support childminders um, early years educators. Um, and these vary again, but can really be quite useful. They offer range of support which might include training advice resources templates for policies some even do insurance so different prices for different services in terms of registration the costs vary um, but generally it's cheaper to join both registers that tends to get you the the cheaper price of 35 pound in terms of safety, again, it depends on what you already have in your home, but it's really important that you have these things in place. And again, insurance, um, you need to have public liability insurance specific to being a childminder. And you will also need to inform your current car insurance and home insurance as to what you're going to be now doing. Um, generally, there aren't additional costs for this, but they will add your service onto the certificate. So it's something you must do. And we have ICO, re ICO registration as well from £35. I think that's for three years. So it's not a huge cost, but that just helps you fulfill the GDPR requirements that you would need to as a data holder and as a business. Again, changes to home and garden and resources. Um, this is all dependent on what your current house is, is like and whether it's safe um, and secure for children. In terms of resources, you should start to think about what resources you might need and maybe do a do a wish list and a budget for when you register. You won't be expected to have everything in place straight away. It's a, it's a gradual process. So as you can see, this is quite a commitment both financially and with your time as you go through this process. So it should be a significant part of your considerations at this stage. And finally, running your own business requires you to follow legal frameworks in terms of health and safety. Think about gas safety, electrical safety, fire safety, water safety, control of substances hazardous to health, food safety, glazing, is that safe in your house, your heating, your radiators? That it's, it's a minefield, um, but the EYFS will help you find, think about all of this under the safeguarding and welfare requirements. Also becoming self-employed, you will be expected to complete annual tax returns. And if you do employ any assistance, then you will also have to ensure you are compliant with employment law. 
Becoming a childminder also means you have statutory requirements to follow as well as additional legal frameworks in protecting children's rights and safeguarding protecting children from harm. So the EYFS is given legal force through the Child Care Act 2006. So this will become your Bible and the document that you need to refer to throughout your early years career. So in theory, every childminder will need local authority planning permission to operate a business from their premises. However, generally, this rule has been greatly relaxed for childminders and usually is only required if new premises are to be developed, if your existing premises are going to be physically extended or altered, or if the use of the childminding um, or daycare is considered a material change of use to the property and that might mean if there's going to be access traffic i went to a local childminder recently and they weren't allowed to run a wraparound because their property was accessed off a private um well it was just like a very narrow lane really so they had some limitations as to what they could offer so Although the planning permission is not normally needed, um, we would advise that you contact your local district council for advice on this just to just to ensure that's the case. So money has been scarce within the early years sector for many years and many childminders have had to fund their own setup costs. However, Good news, spring budget this year, it was announced there would be grants available from autumn 2023. Um, and that would be a £600 grant for those who register directly with Ofsted and £1,200 for those who register with a childminder agency. So this brings me to the route to registering and the choices available to you. So you can decide to register either directly with Ofsted, who will become your regulatory body, or opt to join a childminding agency who will be your regulatory body. So we will investigate that in more detail on the next slide. In terms of the grants, the priority is to support childminders by helping them with the costs incurred when registering and also giving them the flexibility to choose their own pathway into the sector. It is generally more expensive to register with a childminder agency and so that's why the grants reflect this as the government want prospective childminders to have that choice of the route that best suits their needs. So now consideration must be given to which route you would like to take. So here's the question, agency or Ofsted? So there's no doubt people opt to join agencies as they become the regulatory body who will ensure you are meeting the requirements of the EYFS. So Ofsted will inspect the agency rather than you and therefore it can remove that worry of leading an Ofsted inspection which most of us dread. However, agencies still need to regulate you so many will visit your setting annually and their role really is to support but to professionally challenge you as well to ensure you are providing the very best care and meeting those requirements of the EYFS. Now, some people may be very happy not to be inspected by Ofsted. However, the agency's judgment will become your judgment, which will be either effective or ineffective. And unfortunately, joining an agency doesn't guarantee you an effective judgment. So quite recently, November 2022, a childmind agency actually received an ineffective judgment and that had devastating consequences for many of their childminders. Now, each local authority operates differently. However, in most cases, an ineffective or inadequate judgment will mean the removal of funding. So joining an agency doesn't necessarily mean you are safe from the negative impact inspections can sometimes result in. So I suppose you need to ask yourself, would you rather be in control of your own judgment outcome? If you do register directly with Ofsted, you still have to comply with the same statutory requirements, but your inspection judgments are different if you have children on site on that inspection day. So you will have the opportunity to be graded good or outstanding, or if it doesn't go quite to plan, you may get a requires improvement or an inadequate. Um, but these judgments and the report that comes with this will really give your families and future families a real good insight into what you provide daily, um, for your children and it, it really sort of celebrates what you do. So other reasons for joining an agency is the support they can offer you such as training, business advice and support, mentoring, some have access to apps and software which will help enhance and grow your business um, but this does come at a cost so it is a consideration. You need to really think carefully and do your research on the agency if you choose to go down this route. 
Alternatively, you may decide you want full autonomy over your business and therefore you need to register directly with Ofsted. And in this case, there are still many membership groups that can support you in many ways, such as Pacey, Childminder UK or the Early Years Alliance. Now, these memberships can be from as little as £51 per year, and they also offer help plans, helplines, childminding insurance, templates for policies and procedures, free training and resources. And of course, if you decide to register directly with Ofsted, you will automatically get support from the Worcestershire Children's First team um, through regular e-bulletins, terminally network meetings and pre-inspection or post-inspection visits from myself and colleagues. So whichever route you do choose, there is plenty of support and advice to help you succeed at every part of your journey. So let's move on to stage two of the process, research. OK, so we've done step one. We've considered a child minding career and I'm hoping that you're still interested and you're still with me. But we still have got some groundwork to do and we're going to sort of dive now into some deeper level research to make sure that this is the right decision for us. So firstly, we need to establish, is there a need for childcare in your locality? And the recent spring budget um, in 2023 really would suggest that there is a demand nationally, at least for childcare. Now, quite significant changes, as you will see here, for working parents. So those are our parents who are working 16 hours or more. So from April 2024, working parents of two year olds will be able to access 15 hours of free childcare. From September 2024, 15 hours of free childcare will be extended to all children from the age of nine months. That's a real big difference. And then from September 2025, working of parents of children under the age of five will be entitled to 30 hours free childcare per week. So this really is significant changes that we, we are looking at. And hopefully that will increase the demand for childcare places within the next few years. Now, the reason for the staggered approach in the introduction of this funding is really designed to give childcare providers such as yourselves time to prepare for those changes to ensure that we do have enough places for our children and can meet that demand. So, as I said, this announcement would suggest there's a demand nationally, but what about locally? So this is where you need to do your own market research and you might want to contact some local childminders. They're all very friendly and happy to, to work with each other. So it might be um, just doing a bit of uh, your own sort of research. Um, and it might, might even be worth contacting um, Worcestershire Children's first through the Synergy link there, which can actually tell you what um, settings are available within your local area. So, so do a little bit of groundwork just to make sure that you have got that demand. So you have established there is a demand. You now need to think about what age children you want to care for. So there are two main registers. So you have the early years register and that's for providers caring for children from birth to the 31st of August after their fifth birthday. And then you have the child care register, which is broken into two parts. So you have the compulsory part and that is for providers caring for children from the 1st of September after their fifth birthday up to their eighth birthday. And then the voluntary part of that child care register is if you are caring for children who are eight years and older or children 0 to 17 where provision is exempt from registration. So the two registers, you can decide to register on one or both, depending on the child care that you want to provide. But most child minders do actually choose to register with both um, because it's actually a discounted price if you if you have both and it gives you opportunity to grow your business later on as you become settled. So if you do register on the early years register, you must understand and be able to show that you can meet all the requirements of the EYFS. And Ofsted will test your understanding at your registration visit, and this will become part of the compliance as well as you have future inspections. Now, you don't need to understand the EYFS if you only want to join that child care register, but you will need to declare that you can meet all the requirements on the register when you apply. 
So you may want to start with just early years children as you get established. However, if you apply for both, like I said before, it is often cheaper and it gives you that flexibility. So, for example, you, you might decide that you just want early years children, but then you realise um, one of your children has an older sibling and the parents would really like you to care for them before or after school. So the children are together or within holidays. Um, so by being on both registers, that really gives you that flexibility there. And also, I mean, by providing wraparound care for older children, this can really enhance the early years child's experience by having different children within the setting. But it can also increase your income significantly and really help your business to become financially viable. If you're a nanny or a childminder who doesn't need to register by law, you can choose to apply for the voluntary section of the child register if you would like to. OK, so we've established the age of children we want to care for. We now need to really understand how many children we can legally care for within our provision. And this is really important um, as this process will actually help you establish the financial viability of your business at this stage. So let's go back to the EYFS, which states that at any one time, childminders may care for a maximum of six children under the age of eight. And of these six children, a maximum of three may be young children, and there should only be one child under the age of one. So a young child is really a naught to five. So a child up until the 1st of September following his or her fifth birthday. And any care that you provide for older children must not adversely affect the care of children receiving that early years provision. Now, there are no stipulations for over eight, but you must be able to prove that you can meet their needs. So another consideration when you're working out your numbers is the EYFS states that children should always be in sight or hearing of you and usually both. So good practice means that you can always see and hear children. Now, being a childminder and a lone worker, this can be tricky if you need a toilet break. So you need to make sure that they are always in hearing of you um, where possible. Now, employing an assistant may help with this. Um, and childminders must obtain parents or carers permission to leave the children with an assistant for any short periods of time. So exceptions to ratios are permitted as shown on the slide. However, the key message to hold on to is a total number of children under the age of eight must not exceed six per adult. So the number of children you can care for is also determined by the space of your premises as set out in the EYFS. And on this slide, you can see there's very specific measurements and space required for each child that you care for. So part of this process is to measure the free space for play available to you. And you should not include space that is obscured by large furniture. And as a result of this, you may really want to consider the furniture you'll be using within your provision. Hallways also are not normally to be counted in your available space. So it's therefore really important to utilize the space you have and set up multifunction areas. You might want to buy resources which are easy, easily stackable, such as chairs or boxes, and really keep that clutter to a minimum. Less is more, so don't overcrowd your usable spaces with toys and resources. Children need to physically move, so we need to be able to give them resources um, that allow them to learn, but the space in which they can utilize those properly. So here are some examples of how you can turn your home into a, a child minding space. Children are little, so you can really cleverly make use of those low down spaces without impacting too much on your on the room. You could use baskets um, which hold different resources each day for the children to self select. And that's a really popular um, image that we see in many child minding settings and use everyday furniture to store those resources which can then easily be cleared away at the end of the day so your home becomes your home again when you are thinking about safety and how to create a fun learning environment for children get down on the floor have a have a look at your your space through the child's lens what can you reach what can you knock over bump into what can i stick my fingers into what's available to play with is it at their level so get down on the floor with the children and really start to see the setting through their eyes now Ofsted will advise you of how many children you can care for 
on the registration visit, which is later on in the process. So if you successfully apply and you have the registration visit, they would be able to, to look at the space and tell you how many children you should be able to care for. So you don't need to have a garden as long as children access outdoors daily. However, even in the smallest outdoor spaces, this can really enhance the experience for children and allow them that freedom to really develop physically. It's also a great area to burn off that energy. So a usable outside space is certainly beneficial to your provision. Now, many childminders enhance that outdoor experience by exploring local communities, which might mean visits to the local shops, parks, woodlands, libraries, etc. And subscriptions to places such as National Trust or English Heritage can also be a really cost efficient way to widen the child's experience throughout the years. So now it's time to think about your potential financial income and really decide, is this going to come directly from parents, the local authority or a mixture of both? Now, if you register on the Early Years Register, you are eligible to sign up with Worcestershire County Council to receive nursery education funding. And on this slide, um, it states the current funding available to our families. Now, by registering, early years providers agree to abide to a document called the Worcestershire Provider Agreement, which would be sent out to you to, to sign. Now, all providers wishing to offer nursery education funding must deliver the EYFS to a good or outstanding level. Now, providers who are judged by offset as requires improvement will actually be removed from the Worcestershire Directory of Funded Providers for two year old funding and providers who are judged by offset as inadequate will be removed from the Worcestershire Directory of Funded Providers altogether. So that that's all ages. Um, you can get that funding back once you have achieved that good or outstanding um, judgment again. Now, it is important to note that within the Worcestershire Provider Agreement, it states that you cannot receive funding for children that you are directly related to. This is really important because many childminders come into this role because they want to care for their own children or grand grandchildren or family members. So this actually comes from the Child Care Act 2006, which defines child care as excluding care provided for a child by parents or any other relatives. And in England and Wales, the government have interpreted this to mean that childminders are not permitted to claim this free entitlement for their own children or other relatives. So that might be something important that you need to um, think about. Now, once you have applied, you will have some responsibilities. Firstly, to comply with the provider agreement. Secondly, to be open to annual NEF audits where uh, our, our lovely Nikki Burford might come and just check that you're claiming the right amounts. And you will also be requested to complete an annual census. Applying for funding is completed termly and will involve you in putting hours into the Worcestershire Children's First Portal. Parents also have a role to play in funding as they will need to apply for all funding other than the three to four year old funding, which is automatic. So please signpost parents to those government websites. They will also need to sign an annual parental declaration, which you must retain for those auditing purposes. Now, the Worcestershire Children's First website gives more specific detail if you opt in. So please explore this or contact the funding team directly who are a great support. Some childminders choose not to use funding as they can charge more per hour than what they would receive through that NEF funding. This is a decision you must come to when exploring the financial stability of your business. Um, also, please note there is additional funding available for children with SEN or some disadvantaged children over three years old. Also, sometimes there is money for older children who may need additional support and we would advise you speak directly with the Early Years Inclusion team in these cases. And finally, I just want to remind you the information shared today is current today um, with the new changes in the pipeline for more funded places for younger children. Some of these processes will inevitably change. So our websites will keep updating this as this happens. So keep your eye out. So I'm sure your parents are going to be really keen to know when their child can actually receive the funding. Generally, a child will receive funding the term after their second or third birthday. And please remember, at this time, it is only the three to four year olds who will automatically receive NEF. So if your parents are wanting two year funding or to upgrade to the 30 hours funding for three to four year olds, then they would need to apply and it would be dependent on their family circumstance. 
Now, in addition to support working parents with the cost of childcare, they may be eligible to apply for tax free childcare. Now, this is equivalent to 20% of their childcare bill. So encourage them to explore if this is a good option for them. If they successfully apply for tax free childcare, some benefits will automatically stop. So it is important they explore this through the government tool. They will have to manage their account, but this is a really great potential saving and is for all children funded or not. Now, if you do choose to sign up for nursery education funding, this can potentially improve our capacity to safeguard children and families. I want to talk to you about Operation Encompass, and this is a notification service by the police who currently inform schools when a domestic abuse incident has happened within the home. And that allows the schools to really meet the needs of those children the very next day. This excitedly has now been extended to early years children and that means if an early years child is involved in a domestic abuse incident, they are classed as abuse victims in their own right. The police will inform our team and we can then track the child through the funding system to a setting. We would then contact the setting to support you in supporting them. On a similar note, we also represent early years children through MARAC. Now, MARAC stands for a multi-agency risk assessment conference, and this looks at the top 10% of domestic abuse cases where there has been a significant risk to life. As part of these conferences, multi-agencies come together every two weeks to discuss the cases referred into MAREC. And this is chaired by the police and is multi-agency work and at its very best and a time to share information effectively with all the agencies involved with the victim and perpetrator. Each service is represented. People sat around the table could be police, housing, health, probation, education, victim support, the list goes on. And every agency feeds into the meeting. Um, and the information they have to represent the victim really ensures we get a full picture of what's happened and the risks involved. So we are then able to put a plan in place to safeguard. So again, early years are really excited to announce we're now part of this programme. So again, if a funded child attending your setting is identified as a victim, we would contact you to gather information about the child so we can represent the child's voice at the Marit conference. This really does save and improve lives for children and families. So it's a great advantage to offering those funded places. So before you can apply to be a childminder, you need to have completed specific training. So this is why your training sits within step two, that research part of this process. So safeguarding is obviously a huge part of the work early as professionals do on a daily basis, and therefore there will be training involved. As the registered person, you will automatically become the designated safeguarding lead for your setting and have to attend biannual training to this level. It's also expected that you will keep your knowledge up to date also. By attending the DSL training provided through Worcestershire Children's First, you will ensure you understand all those local procedures and have access to safeguarding and child protection policy templates to support you within this role. In addition, Worcestershire, Children, Worcestershire Children's First provide free termly DSL network meetings where we are updated on safeguarding themes, local information, and often hear from guest speakers ensuring we are well equipped for the role that we play. To register, please contact the workforce support team who will be able to give you a login to access all of our training. So in addition to the DSL training, the statutory framework for the Early Years Foundation stage states that to become a registered childminder, you must have undertaken a full paediatric first aid course, and this is 12 hours. Now, Worcestershire Children's First do not provide this training, so we suggest that you look around locally. It must meet the requirements of the EYFS, which is detailed on the slide. So this is the back page, the annex of the EYFS, and it states exactly what you need to be um, covering within this qualification. But most companies will actually state this in their advertisement that they are Ofsted compliant. Now, the course um, needs to be 12 hours, but that can be blended, which works quite well. So that might be six hours online and then six hours face to face. But as the annex states, certain parts of that course, such as CPR, need to be completed face to face. So have a look around and um, see what you can find. The qualification needs to be completed every three years. And Ofsted will want to see that full certificate on the registration visit. Um, little credit card passes aren't um, suitable, you need to actually show the full certificate. And if you employ an assistant, as I think I said on previous slides, and you leave them unattended um, for under two hours, they would also need that qualification. Anybody left on their own with children need that full paediatric first aid.
And finally, you must have undertaken training that helps you to understand and implement the EYFS if you are registered on that early years register. Now, requirements for early years qualifications really is dependent on local authorities, so it can differ nationally. Worcestershire Children's First have two webcasts we would like all new child minders to access. In addition, the Department for Education have free training that we highly recommend all new child minders complete. Please feel free to complete additional training as well. So um, the Open University, for instance, offer free courses on a range of subjects across child development. And also, if you do choose to join a membership support group, there's quite often free training involved with this as well. What you need to remember, what's most important is that for your registration, you need to have a good understanding of the EYFS and child development. Now, some of you may have gained qualifications outside of the UK and you can check if these are full and relevant by looking at this through the government website. Now, on this slide are two really important documents which will also help you build your knowledge across the EYFS. And this is Development Matters and Birth to Five Matters. I would really recommend getting hold of these. You can get them um, online and read both these documents fully so you have a really good understanding of what you are committing to deliver. If you have already completed some form of early years training, it is still wise to update that knowledge as the EYFS was last updated in 2021. And there is some new terminology and priorities for working with young children. It's important that you fully understand that. If you have completed a childcare qualification a while ago, you are able to still check if this is um, relevant and full by checking through the government website. Your final research should be around the setting up of your business and there is local authority support throughout this process. The support for businesses page on the Worcestershire County Council website will signpost you to a range of support. My top tips are to have clear terms and conditions around payment from parents so that you're able to keep that cash flow, budget well, keep receipts and grow slowly. So for those of you who are still with me and feel ready to take that next step, it's time to move on to step three of the process, the application. Now to register, you need to be 18 or over and have the right to work in the United Kingdom, be suitable to work with children, be physically and mentally capable of caring for children and have completed an enhanced DBS application for you or anybody aged 16 and over who lives or works where you will be running your child minding business. Timing is key here as a delay can scupper your whole registration process. So from the very beginning, the process can take up to several months due to that training that some of you might need to complete beforehand. So it's all dependent on your circumstance. Um, and obviously you need to get those security checks in place. Therefore, things that you need to consider are the paediatric first aid course, for example, needs to be completed within eight weeks of applying. So you can do this after applying, but it needs to be done before your registration visit. DBS checks can take a while and Ofsted will only accept DBS up to three months old. So if there are delays in registration, this may cause you problems. Um, so this is why Ofsted often recommend that you join that update service, which we talked about earlier, which was at that £13 a year cost. A heads up to reasons that can cause disqualification from registration. Maybe if you've been convicted of a serious offence or you're barred from working with children, if your children have ever been taken into care, if you've been refused registration before or your registration has been cancelled for a reason other than you're not paying your annual fee, or if you live with someone who is disqualified from registration. Now, you only get one chance to apply for registration, so it's really important that you have everything in place, and that's what we're going to go through now. So before you can apply, you need to have completed your DBS checks, and that's for you and anybody else who lives or works in the home age 16 and over. And you need to do that through the Ofsted DBS application link. So if you just Google Ofsted DBS application, it will come up um, and it's quite a simple process. Now, it's really important that you keep 
this up going forward and what I mean by that is if you have changes in your home so if you have a new partner moving as your children go older and they might have uh, partners moving in as well just always be aware that anybody over 16 and over needs to have that DBS and quite a lot of child minors have been caught um, out by that in the past by forgetting that important point if you employ assistance as well they will also need that enhanced criminal record as will anyone who regularly works in your home Okay, so we're going to move on to the health and declaration form and this is really to ensure you are physically and mentally capable to care for children um, and it's also there to protect you they want to ensure that child minding isn't going to adversely affect your health so this doesn't involve a medical and you don't actually have to visit the doctor unless you would really like to it's quite a detailed form as you will mostly be working alone with children and officers really want to ensure both you and the children are kept safe so questions may be around anything that affects your physical ability to walk walk, balance or bend, any effects, anything that affects your hearing or vision, um, if you suffer from depression or panic attacks, or if you have heart conditions or maybe diabetes. This form also talks about any medication you are currently taking or any treatment you are receiving. Now declaring conditions does not mean an automatic refusal, however we would advise a conversation with your doctor. In complex cases, your application will most probably be risk assessed by Ofsted, who may consult with their own doctors before a decision is made. So Ofsted can refuse or cancel registration if they consider you're not suitable to care for children or that you have knowingly withheld information or made a false declaration. So don't forget to be completely honest when you fill in the form and don't withhold anything. Remember, you only get one opportunity to apply. It's time to apply. So the process is really easy once you have everything in place. So let's pretend we have all had our DBS returned for anybody 16 and over in our household who works in our home and our own. Um, we have a signed health declaration form from the doctor and a certificate to state we have achieved our paediatric first aid qualification. We also have details of any EYFS training we have undertaken and we had decided on what age children we would like to care for and the registers that we are going to apply for. We are now ready to fill in that application form. It's time to take the next step. So it's a really simple process. You just follow the government link to the application page and here you will need to provide an email address and a, a mobile number and an email will be sent to you with a link to access the registration service. If you need to leave the form part way through you'll be able to return and carry on later and when you return to the form a five digit verification code will be sent to the mobile number you provided and you'll need to enter that code to access your application. You'll pay for your application fee when you submit that form as you can see from the last image on the slide, there is a clear list for you to work through. You just enter details as requested. And as you work through the form, you would upload documents where required. It doesn't matter if you add things in a different order and you can come in and out of that application prior to hitting the send button. Now, Offset will reject the application if you don't have all the paperwork uploaded or the information input as requested. So don't hit send until you are 100% sure you have everything you need. Once you've submitted your application, Ofsted will acknowledge this. They will then start checking your information and that of other adults who live with you. And if you've applied to the earliest register, Ofsted will call you to arrange a registration visit. Now, if everything goes to plan and there are no delays, you could be registered within 12 weeks. So use this time wisely, planning your environment and preparing for that registration visit. Now, I know that many people can get nervous when Ofsted are mentioned, but there really is no need. We must remember they are a regulatory body who are ultimately there to keep children safe and ensure we as providers are fulfilling our legal requirements in the delivery of the child care or early as registers. This helps set standards and improves outcomes for children and it also reassures our parents that they're placing their children with adults who are suitable to provide the important job of care and early education for their children. So don't be daunted by Ofsted, let's use them to improve what we do and to um, really improve outcomes for children and families. 
So if you're registering on the early years register, an offset inspector will visit your home in order to ensure you fully understand the requirements of the UFS and that your setting is safe and suitable for the children in your care. Now the registration visit is a really important part of this registration process and will normally take place once all the checks are complete, but it could take place earlier. It's generally a pre-book visit and you will need to be prepared to share documentation and be able to articulate confidently about how you are going to fulfill the EYFS requirements. What is required on the day will be discussed in a telephone conversation with the inspector prior to their visit. It's therefore important to be organised and have all that information free to hand. There are some examples of documentation to be verified on this slide. On arrival, it's important that you ask the inspector for proof of identity and inspectors will carry photographic identity cards. In addition to checking your documentation, the inspector will want you to explain how you intend to implement the legal requirements of the EYFS. So a thorough knowledge of the statutory framework is therefore vital. The inspector will talk to you and take notes about what you say to help decide about your suitability to care for children. You should think about how you will put into practice the four principal themes of the EYFS framework, um, the unique child, positive relationships, enabling environments and learning and development. And if you're unsure about this, you need to revisit this within some um, further training or by going through the EYFS. So you must ensure that all children who may attend your provision, irrespective of ethnicity, culture, religion, home language, family background, learning difficulties, disabilities, gender or ability have the opportunity to experience a challenging and enjoyable programme of learning and development. The inspector will also check your premises, furniture, equipment and toys, including outside. Now they won't expect all resources and equipment to be in place, but you will need some for the ages of children you are registering for. It is a good idea to have a wish list to share with the inspector. And it is important that all resources and equipment are clean and comply to safety regulations. Now, all of this will help the inspector understand how you intend to care for and educate young children, remembering that all children learn most effectively through purposeful play. So prior to the registration visit, it'd be a really good idea to really start to unpick the EYFS statutory guidance and be ready to respond to how you will deliver this. Now, I've put together just some random questions. However, it will probably be to your advantage if you lead some of the dialogue rather than waiting to be asked questions. Um, for example, if I was going to be um, inspected by an Ofsted inspector, I would want to really sell my passion, why I want to work with children, what I'm going to offer the childcare sector. So I might start by saying, I want to really explain to you my beliefs, which underpin my passion for working with children. Now, my big thing is outdoors. I love children to have access to outdoors and local communities because I believe this really supports their mental health and mindfulness activities that you can get from being outdoors and at one with nature are really, really important. Outdoors also gives children freedom and allows them to develop their imaginations, which in turn will develop them and embed their vocabulary. So it's about really selling what's important to you and what how your provision is going to look for the child. Um, I might talk about the community. That was really important to me as I felt children um, need to feel that, that sense of belonging and that sense of ownership for where they live. So exploring that local environment is really, really important to build their confidence and their understanding of the, of the world. And in turn, that will support their mental health and help them develop important life skills, such as road safety, for instance. So show your passion. That's what's important to me. What's important to you will be completely different, but try and get that over um, within that that short short time really that you'll have with the inspector to really um, show them and demonstrate what makes your setting unique. It's the safeguarding and welfare requirements of the EYFS which really helps us keep children safe. So you should really start considering what policies, procedures and documentation you should have. So although you won't need policies and procedure documents in place prior to your offset visit, it's useful to have some pre-prepared to share with them. Now, there are only three written policies required. However, I would urge all early years providers develop a range of policies which cover your practice. 
And the reason is the process of writing policies is really a good way to think and reflect on your provision, to really think about those tricky situations. You know, what happens if a child goes missing? What, what are you going to do? You can use templates from many sources, but just make sure your policies are relevant to your unique practice. And when scenarios occur, ideally you would go to your policy for the answer. And if it's not there, the policy may need adapting. It should be a working, evolving document which has purpose. And having and sharing policies and procedures with parents will also promote the professionalism of what you do. And it gives that transparency. When I was in practice, there was always the question over where, when you send a child home due to their temperature. If you have this in your medication policy, um, then this is transparent to your parents from the very beginning. Policies, of course, are also really important if you employ assistance or if you co-mine, so you're working from the same hymn sheet. Offset will also expect you to have risk assessed your home and garden to ensure the safety of children in your care. So it may be worth looking at creating some written risk assessments, which will cover um, different elements of your practice. OK, so again, these are just a range of questions that you need to be prepared to answer. Um, the key is to know the statutory guidance and get your family to ask you a question. It's only when we start to think about different scenarios that we can really start to formulate our responses to these. Another tool to help you in your preparations for those questions that you'll be asked in your registration visit is the Early Years Inspection Handbook for Ofsted Registered Provision. Now, this sets out how you would be judged in a normal um, inspection process. So this isn't what you're judged on in your registration visit, but it's what you're aiming for. And you they would look at your safeguarding procedures, your leadership, the quality of education you provide, and behaviour and attitudes of the children, and also their personal development. So if you use that document and go through the grade descriptors of what is expected to achieve certain grades, this will really help you start to think about what questions you might be asked within your within your registration visit. And it just really gets you thinking about your delivery of the EYFS. OK, so you're all prepared for your visit and the day has arrived. Preparation is key, so you are really able to enjoy the experience. So I've put together some top tips. Be prepared with that documentation. Make sure it's to hand and you're not flustered by trying to find that safeguarding certificate or um, the paediatric first aid certificate. Have it all to hand in a, in, a, in a professional way. Maybe put it in a nice file. You know, these are all first impressions. So remember that. Demonstrate your knowledge um, from recent training. So it's really important that we acknowledge that we've been on training, but how actually will that impact what you do on a day to day um, basis. Be passionate about your vision. Being a childminder is, is purely unique and what you offer children, although you are delivering the EYFS, how you deliver that will be unique to you. So really sell what is different about your setting. Why would families choose to come to you over another setting or, or another childminder in the area? What makes you unique? It's really important that you show that you're informed and that you have access to all of those documents, such as the EYFS, the inspection handbook, working together to safeguard children, all that important um, documentation, which sort of threads through what you do on a daily basis. Make sure that you refer to that in your conversations and really talk about the child experience. What are you hoping to create for that child? What would a normal day in your setting be like for that child? It's really important that you're honest as well. Um, it takes time to embed practice in early years. No day is ever the same. So be honest in your discussions. This is what I want to achieve, but this is how I'm going to build this slowly to make sure my practice is consistently good. You may also want to talk about how you will evaluate your practice and what support networks you're hoping to engage with, whether that be other childminders or it might be the Worcestershire Children's First Networks that are already in place. Remember, this is your first impression and you only get one shot at this application. So if you are prepared and true to yourself, all should be well.
So the nice thing about this registration visit is you will actually be told at the end of the visit whether the inspector will recommend you as being suitable or not suitable for registration. Now it's really important to recognise if you are refused registration you will be disqualified from applying to be a childminder in the future. So it is important that if the visit isn't going well that you may consider withdrawing this application at this time. Now, if you don't demonstrate that you are suitable to be registered, you will be sent a notice of intention to refuse and you have 14 working days to uh, respond to that. Um, and if they don't hear from you, a notice of decision to refuse registration will be sent to you. There is information on how to appeal this, so you would just follow those links and uh, go through that process. So your relationship with Ofsted going forward may be through inspection, if you're on the early years register where you'll be inspected every six years. Um, if you're on the child care register, you may be inspected. We'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. Um, but the most importantly, by law, you must keep your details up to date. And it's really important you keep Ofsted updated of any significant changes to your provision. So this could be changes to people in the household, your contact details, your days and times of opening. It could be you've had a temporary illness and you've had to close for illness or recuperation it's really important that you share this information with them many childminders and settings have fallen down here and received inadequate judgments at their next inspection because they failed to notify Ofsted of something deemed important my advice is even if it seems minor let them know and retain the email or the telephone correspondence as evidence of informing them informing you sorry now Ofsted are working really hard at the moment to keep us all informed of research and to have platforms where we, we can access them easier. So make use of those. There's also a lot of um, funding commitments now with the COVID recovery program, which is offering mentoring for childminders. Um, so they're really starting to value the unique experience you can offer early years children and families and really celebrating the role of the childminder. Well done. So you are now a fully fledged childminder. You have your certificate and your early years reference and it's time to register your first families. So this is the time to really sort of pin down that final paperwork. It's the time to make sure that all your business requirements are in place. So have you registered for HMRC? Have you registered for the ICO? Now, the ICO is for any business or sole trader who processes personal personal information, which you will have as part of your role. You must register with the ICO under the Data Protection Act 2018. Also, we need to think about food standards. So when childminders register with Ofsted, they will automatically be registered with their local authority as a food business. You must comply with food safety and hygiene regulations if you provide food and drink for children or babies. And this includes meals and snacks to actually serving them milk in a bottle or reheating food from a parent or food that you cut up and prepare. So it's a really good idea to look at the Safer Food website, which has a childminder specific pack for you to download and to work from. In terms of accounts, it's important you keep on track with your accounts regularly. So really think about the systems you are going to use to record that income and expenditure and really ensure you're clear on your hours of opening and cost per hour for your families. Really good idea to set out some clear terms and conditions for your families in regard to the service you provide and the payment conditions for this. Now, registering with Worcestershire Children's First should actually be automatic and Ofsted do contact us when you first register and then after your visit and you get your registration certificate. However, if you don't hear from us, you will need to speak to the systems team who can get you set up on our system. And there's some useful emails on the slide there. Now, you can advertise through Worcestershire Children's First if you allow us permissions. So once you have a login for the provider portal, you can log in and complete an online form, which is called Update Your Details, which includes consent for us to advertise your provision. Now, in readiness for your families, you'll also need to create registration forms. And this is also the time to finalise any policies and procedures and share these with your registered parents. And then I think you're done.
So the practicalities and logistics of running a child minding business really can only be learned on the job. So be ready to adapt and reflect on your provision so you are to continually improve. This will take time and patience. The first few weeks can be difficult as you settle into the role, whilst also settling in children. Be kind to yourself and celebrate those small wins. It may be a good idea to start as you mean to go on and start to develop an action plan to work towards and the early years team can support with this. You will appear on the early years caseload, meaning you will be eligible to three support as a proposed setting and then once newly registered until your first official inspection, usually at 30 months. We can also support with safeguarding self-assessment audit, which helps us to ensure you are meeting all the safeguarding and welfare requirements. Now, it demonstrates great leadership being able to identify strengths and areas for development involving parents, professionals and children in this process makes it even better. So observe and listen to their responses and use that inspection handbook to start to evidence how you are meeting the EYFS requirements. Now, delivering the EYFS is a whole separate training course, so please keep an eye out for training in the training directories and this would be um, a training course that you would complete once you've been in practice for a little while and you have some experience to reflect upon. So we move on to the final step, which is compliance and inspecting registered child minders really helps us to improve the quality of childcare and early education by making judgments about the quality of the care that child minders offer and then gives recommendations about how to improve this. So child minders really must provide evidence of their continued suitability and show how they meet the requirements of the, the EYFS. Childminders who fail to meet or fully meet the specific requirements at inspection are often given actions to improve and where there are serious concerns, Ofsted may take other enforcement action to bring about that improvement. So Ofsted sometimes might receive information from parents and others about the child minding provision. And so to ensure that registered providers continue to be suitable, Ofsted may carry out an inspection and refer this information back to the child minder or investigate further into this matter. Where childminders can't provide evidence that they meet the requirements, Ofsted may give them actions to improve. And where there are serious concerns, Ofsted may take other enforcement action to bring about that improvement. Most childminders, however, are rated good or outstanding, so aim high. Separate training is available for preparing for inspection. And I would recommend don't leave this until the last minute. We shouldn't be preparing for Ofsted three months before a visit. We should be preparing for children, making sure that what we do on a daily basis is really making a difference. So access this training in plenty of time for you to be able to work towards those goals. Congratulations, we've reached the end of this presentation. Um, I just want to say well done. You have committed to the most wonderful career supporting children and families. And it would be wrong of me not to acknowledge the complexity of this role and you will have tough days. However, the privilege of working with children really does outweigh this. You truly will make a difference and change people's lives. So thank you. Thank you for joining me as we explored the process of becoming a childminder. I do hope that this process um, looks a little bit simpler now as we've gone through all the stages. I will bid you farewell now and I wish you the very best as you embark on this journey. But don't forget, we are here to help you. So please keep in touch. We are only a phone call or an email away. Thank you for listening.